Okay. Welcome everybody. Gonna wait uh, a few seconds uh, as people trickle in. <clears throat> Or, or or rush in as it looks like actually it's more of a, a flow of people welcome everybody <clears throat> right so <laughs> welcome welcome to the um what are we now we're the Lawton naval uh unit um welcome to uh the department of uh, war studies and to king's college uh london all three levels were the host of the King's Maritime History Seminars, which are organized, uh, as many of you know, by the British Commission for Maritime History, um, along with the support of the Society for Nautical Research, uh, and additional support from uh, Lloyd's uh, Register. Um, this is the last uh, of this term's uh, seminars. Um, there's a, a fuller program for, for next term in the in the works, not uh, not yet complete, uh, but I'm aiming to to restart on the 7th of January and uh, we'll go uh, fortnightly from there. Um, more information, of course, uh, will follow and, and hopefully quite shortly. But for now, uh, I have uh, the enormous uh, pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Faye Han uh, professor of English Literature at the University of Glasgow, whose PhD, I understand, was in Canadian literature, which uh, is my heart, of, uh, of course. I'm very pleased uh, to know that. Um, and among the many, many things uh, about which she writes and works and researches uh, is uh, literature and the ocean liner. Um, and that's uh, why uh, we invited her to speak to us today and why we're so grateful uh, that she's uh, come. So it's with our uh, collective thanks, uh, Faye, that we uh, welcome, and welcome you to the, to the, to the seminar. Uh, and I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation, I think. This is certainly the first time I've been hosted by a school of security studies. It seems quite far away from English literature. So I'm just going to try and share my PowerPoint now. Okay. That seems to be working. Um, so this title um, covers quite a broad topic and I've actually amassed quite a lot of material on this theme now. Um, so I've just selected um, some part of it that I think will make this talk hang together and, and fit into about half an hour. Um, and that's a focus on the interwar liner's role in the material aspects of transatlantic literary culture. So I mean, how did the liner affect practices of producing, circulating and consuming printed text. Um, and aside from one or two slides, um, I haven't presented any of this material before, so comments will definitely be very welcome. So during the 1920s and 1930s, um, literary texts were read, written, printed and even published on board ship. And books and periodicals were of course exported via sea routes, um, but also on board lent among passengers or three ships libraries, and occasionally even bought and sold on ocean liners. And I'm increasingly aware that some shipping lines took quite a proactive role in the transatlantic print marketplace. And at the same time, the liner was taking on an increasingly important symbolic value in a transatlantic imaginary. So its cultural influence being felt um, in all sorts of fields, painting, photography, performance, architecture. And then in terms of literature, which is my main field, um, quite a large part of the action on various, in various um, plays and shows and novels unfolds on board an Atlantic liner. Um, and I'm just showing here a small sample of the ones I've been working on recently. Um, and in a lot of these texts, you find 
um, scenes of reading, so scenes where characters are engaged with or actually more often failing to be engaged with a book. Um, and these can give us a lot of insight into the relationship between literary and travel culture. So in this talk, I'm going to use um, both fictional and non-fictional sources to investigate this role of the interwar steamship in both inspiring and enacting or making it happen um, transatlantic literary exchange and um, because of the expertise of this audience I'm not going to include any discussion of the history of the ocean liner because I think you know all that either because you're maritime historians or because you're my mates and you've been listening to me talking about it for quite a while now um, so I'm going to start right away with an author Margaret Ayer Barnes, an American writer who has been very much forgotten now, but she was very successful um, in this period. And um, this novel Westward Passage was so successful that it was made into a film the following year. Um, the main character, Olivia, um, at the beginning of the story boards a liner in Cherbourg to return home to New York. And her maid, um, in the quotation, had established Olivia in the steamer chair with seven farewell telegrams, two new English biographies and three French novels, Vian de Paretre, on her lap and the five gardenias sent by that amusing boy in the Paris embassy pinned to the lapel of her new mink coat. Olivia had not opened the books. She had glanced at the telegrams and had sniffed the gardenias and thought instantly of Nick. So along with the flowers and the coat, the books are accessories. They're chosen to enhance Olivia's performance of glamorous modernity and to demonstrate how up to date her tastes are and how she has this ability to read French and so on. Um, Nick is Olivia's former husband um, and unexpectedly to her, but perhaps not very surprisingly to us as readers, he's on the same ship, he's on the same voyage. So she feels she ought to avoid him. Um, and so the second day out, she confines herself to the cabin. And this is her sitting in her cabin, um, unable to focus on reading. And her inattention to the book is um, a kind of um, symptom of her returning feeling for Nick. So about five lines down into this passage, a French novel was lying on Olivia's lap. She had cut the first 20 pages, so she's just uh, it's a new novel, the pages are still folded and she's cut them with a paper knife and had read three. But the book was dull, she thought, and the construction rather difficult. She did not want to read it. There was nothing she wanted to do. Um, Nick himself is um, a famous author, very popular, but it was actually his dedication to this career which caused their divorce in the first place. So it makes sense that Olivia doesn't turn to literature for solace in this scene. Um, she experiences her first class cabin as, as narrow and restrictive. There's a lot of emphasis on the smallness of the room and how much she wants to get out of it. Um, and like so many of the books I've read, this one presents only the, the perspective of the wealthy passenger. And it ignores, for instance, the far greater confinement that would have been experienced by passengers in the lower classes of travel and especially by the crew. So I've been trying to find more examples of texts that represent the experience of crew members on a liner. There were not very many um, and fewer still which represent their experience of reading. But I do have this one um, book by Humphrey Jordan. Um, and he too has been very much forgotten, but he was uh, sufficiently celebrated in his day that there were about 10 um, pictures of him in the National Portrait Gallery's collection. And he was the author of quite a large number of seafaring books. And the story of this novel, Seaway Only, um, is about a first officer called John Coke, who is just about to become a captain. And he's always accompanied by a loyal steward called Alfred Fudge, um, who was actually a former um, seaman himself and became injured. And at the start, um, Coke is introduced from Fudge's point of view. Um, and in this scene, the steward is taking care of Coke's private quarters. Dusting the books followed, and that was a matter of sheer pride. Not a great reader himself, Alfred Fudge was able to admire frankly the habit in the man he served. 
Never before had Fudge come in close contact with a private library of such magnitude. There were 93 volumes in the collection and the day when he would be able to spread the news around the ship that the 100 mark had been topped could not be far away. So this idea of the personal library and its increase as a topic for ship's gossip is quite intriguing. It seems that the possession or the accumulation of these books seems to confer a certain distinction on Coke, um, but it also makes him appear a bit eccentric. Um, and so he's, he's increasingly respected by his crew, but also seems to belong to a separate world from them. And in terms of their actual content in the second paragraph of the passage now, the books were almost entirely about the sea and ships, mostly technical and fudge considered with a headache to every page. There was one, a portly volume costing the outrageous sum of 30 shillings, calling itself modern shipping, which made fudge considered almost indecent reading for a master mariner. It was concerned with the way in which shipping companies could earn dividends, a subject fit for owners, but hardly proper for an officer. So Fudge is committed to a strict division between the owners as profit makers and the crew as dedicated professionals. But I think that his shock at the, the violation of this division by Coates reading of this book is equaled by his shock at its price. So I want to introduce the idea that of reading as investment. Coke sees reading this book and buying this book as an investment. So his books are not just for display like Olivia's books. Um, continuing the quotation, um, yet like all the others, it had been read. So he has cut all the pages, you know, not again, not like Olivia. Behind Coke's easy smile, Fudge recognized a brain. Modern shipping offended him. But one of the few non-technical volumes, Reynard the Fox, the illustrated edition, filled him with pride. He had read it. It was almost the only poetry he had ever read, understood it, admired it. He was, it was his standby when he wanted to recall his childhood on the land. So the steward sees books as a source of entertainment and a connection to the past, rather than as a way of accessing practical knowledge. So Coke's reading as part of his work and Fudge's is an escape from it. And we can assume that in many voyages, um, crew members would not have had much time for reading and would have had to snatch moments from other duties, whereas passengers would often have had long stretches of empty time to fill. So I want to turn now to the book from which my title is taken. Um, it's a kind of uh, combination of guidebook and almanac and travel narrative. Um, Basil Woon was a British born journalist and he emigrated to the US at the age of um, 16 and he worked as a foreign correspondent and a ghostwriter and a quite an unreliable um, celebrity biographer. Um, and he himself was quite a celebrity himself, as you can see from his having been photographed by Lee Miller. Um, but he's actually much less remembered than Aaron Douglas, the Harlem artist who did the beautiful design for his book cover. And actually the reason that this volume is now of interest to collectors is very much because of the cover, not the contents. But there's lots of interesting things inside it too. So Basil Wound writes, after all, there is very little to do on a ship. Um, and he talks about what he feels that he should be doing as a writer. So in the middle paragraph, he says, one may spend one's time in the cabin reading, one may even work. I have never begun a voyage yet that I didn't swear to myself that I would do two things, I would rest and I would work. I have never done either, but I've eaten too much and drunk too much and played cards too much. So the temptations of sensory indulgence and romance and dissipation always seem to be at war with the, um, the sort of travel companies construction or even the conventional construction of travel as a mode of learning and self-development. Again, a form of investment in your own education. Um, Basil Wound's book is addressed to first time or potential travelers. Um, and that's why I've put an image of a tourist third cabin advertisement here because um, as you know, following the end of World War I, the steerage section on transatlantic liners gradually be became replaced with um, a tourist cabin. And a trip to Europe was increasingly within the range of, let's say, middle class North Americans. And these are the people that the book is addressed to. 
I'm going to just turn to the opening paragraph of Basil Wound's book. He starts, drinks, divorces and dresses are the principal reasons why Americans go to Europe. Um, some of you make the crossing with a view to seeing Europe and often Europe is more successful in seeing them. So the Americans become the spectacle. Um, and Wound suggests that the trip eastward is really about opportunities for consumption and display and also escape from the restrictions of prohibition era America. Um, even though maybe it's a sensible aim is to immerse the traveler in, in art and culture and history. And Wune also offers a kind of typology or classification of regular Atlantic travelers. So he says they may be classified in four divisions, professional men, meaning writers, professional women, meaning actresses, alimony hunters and ocean vampires, society people and buyers, like buyers for fashion houses, for example, he means. And then he adds, um, in the last sentence, and whether Anita Luz has anything to do with it or not, most of the ocean vamps I have met are blondes. So that takes me on to another text that has crucial scenes set on an ocean liner. And here, perhaps you're glad to see an author that you've actually heard of, because the others I was using were rather obscure names. Um, so Anita Luz was a successful screenwriter when she published her first novel in 1925. Um, and the subtitle, if you notice um, in the small print under Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, is The Illuminating Diary of a Professional Lady. So you see where Basil Wound got his reference from. And this became a bestseller, and it was also admired by intellectuals, everyone from James Joyce to Edith Wharton to William Empson. And it takes the form of Lorelei Lee's badly spelled and innuendo laden diary. Um, Lorelei lives in New York. Um, where her very luxurious lifestyle is funded by Mr. Eisman, her sugar daddy, who's a button manufacturer. Um, and Eisman sends Lorelei with her friend Dorothy on a tour to Europe, which both he and Lorelei insist will be educational. That's a real keyword in the text. Um, they leave on the Majestic. This is one of the illustrations by Ralph Barton from the original um, novel. And uh, Lorelai is soon criticizing her friend for spending her time unprofitably. So Dorothy is out taking a walk up and down the deck with a gentleman she met on the steps. But I am not going to waste my time going around with gentlemen, because if I did nothing but go around, I would not finish my diary or read good books, which I'm always reading to improve my mind. So this circular, um, pleasurable, but purposeless movement around the deck is contrasted with, the, with linear productive processes such as reading or writing books. In actual fact, Lorelei is being disingenuous because her tourist journey is not really um, oriented towards education, but towards accumulation as she tries to amass um, both social and financial capital. And that's why she reprimands Dorothy for wasting time with men who are not rich. Um, at the end, she says, I always scold her because she does nothing but waste her time by going around with gentlemen who do not have anything. Um, whereas she had been invited on various dates by um, a film magnate who could have offered her a lot more. So Lorelai's references to books are always part of her discursive projects of improvement, which ostensibly involves the productive use of leisure time. And that was according to the ideals of the middle brow culture of her period. The rhetoric of self-improvement emphasized mental cultivation, um, but the real purpose of people often, of people who engaged with um, the cultural institutions of the middle brow, so I'm thinking of things like book clubs and university extension courses, was really to enhance their social and hence their financial status. So Lorelei makes the hidden aims of this culture um, explicit. Mr. Eisman, is, um, sends her quite a lot of books for the journey. She receives from him a large book of etiquette. As he says, there is quite a lot of etiquette in England and it would be a good thing for a girl to learn. Um, so she takes it on the deck to read. And a few pages later, the second part of my quotation, I've decided not to read the book of etiquette as I glance through it, which is all that she ever does with any books. And it does not seem to have anything in it that I would care to know. 
Um, so I will not waste my time on such a book. So time spent on reading, again, can be considered an investment, like I said. Um, but Lorelei wants a quicker return. So um, she actually pays somebody not to guide her reading as those um, institutions like um, book clubs or educational broadcasts might do, um, but actually to do it for her. So here's one um, other passage, which is illustrated by um, this drawing of Lorelei rather baffled, surrounded by um, this complete set of books that she's been given for her birthday by a gentleman called Mr. Conrad. They all seem to be about ocean travel, although I have not had time to more than glance through them. And then she reveals her real interest in ocean travel. I have always liked novels about ocean travel ever since I posed for the front cover of a novel about ocean travel, because I always say that a girl never really looks as well as she does on board a steamship. So this repetitive, almost automated language that um, Lorelei kind of generates points to her status as a sort of artificial construct. But I also find it quite relevant to the kind of confined and circular and repetitive movements that she makes around the ship. Um, so she's got all these novels, she's just kind of sitting baffled by them. So she decides, um, this morning I told Lulu, that's her maid, to let all of the housework go and spend the day reading a book entitled Lord Jim and then tell me all about it so that I would improve my mind while Jerry is away. So the, this literal kind of offloading of the task of reading, almost as if she can kind of absorb the knowledge from somebody else, also draws attention to the fact that the people who ostensibly serve her are much more capable with, of engaging with this difficult literature. Um, so as in that um, Westwood passage, there's much more here about not reading than about reading. Um, and Lorelei presents a less benign version of Olivia's instrumental use of books to advance her social progress. So not many novels represent liner passengers actually reading, um, but there's historical evidence to suggest that um, cultures of reading have in reality been very important um, on liner journeys and that print materials were extensively circulated on board. Um, there is some really fascinating research in this field. Um, a lot of it examines the reading of um, emigrants or sailors, especially in the long 19th century. Um, I'm just going to provide a really brief summary of some of this work and I've just put um, some references here. So firstly, liners carried printing presses, and again, a lot of people will know this in this audience, um, from as early as the 18th century. Um, the Vanessa Histon Roberts article um, explores why shipboard space was devoted to bulky printing presses, and she finds that a lot of the um, uses were more related to the entertainment of the crew than to actually producing any practical documents. Secondly, liners carried libraries, um, and according to Bill Bell, um, prior to the age of steam, ships' libraries were often rather haphazard collections of books um, and sometimes left behind by previous passengers um, or introduced by charities or authorities for the purpose of educating um, emigrants and, and even convicts. Um, but then Susan Liebig um, explains that with the advent of um, modern liners, she says, and I'm quoting now, shipping companies began to more purposefully contemplate the provision of reading matter for the use of passengers as part of their facilities, unquote. And she says they sometimes kept their collections up to date by having arrangements with publishers and booksellers so that sets of books could be changed at the end of each voyage. And Liebig, by studying um, extant catalogues of ships' libraries, has discovered lots of interesting things, that the ratio of um, books to passengers was higher than in most land-based lending libraries. Um, and also that while fiction predominated, there would also be poetry, biography, and travel writing commonly available. Um, her research rate relates to routes in the Anglophone Pacific. Um, while the Simon Frost uh, chapter focuses on Atlantic routes, um, and he points out that many libraries held multilingual collections, and that was especially true on the German lines. Um, so this evidence starts to help us capture a sense of the liner as a site of intercultural or, or um, literary, international literary exchange. Um, some libraries lent books for free. 
Um, whereas others were run on a subscription model. Um, so they required a payment to cover the duration of the voyage. And a few such as the library on the Mauritania that's shown here offered books for sale as well as to, to borrow. Um, some German ships had these wonderful vending machines. You have to move the little video if it's in the way of that picture. Um, so you can see that one. Um, they're by the uh, important industrial designer Peter Behrens and they were introduced in 1912. By 1917, there were 2000 of these in operation, um, some at train stations and some on board liners and some at spas. And they were in production until 1940, according to the Museum of the Reclam Publishing House. Um, I'll have something else to say about selling books on board in a minute. Um, but I also want to mention that as well as uh, lending and selling reading material, um, it was also printed um, on board. So on the 4th of June 1904, the earliest maritime daily newspaper brought out its first issue, the Cunard Daily Bulletin, uh, which was produced on board um, the RMS Campania, Campania, one of the earliest liners to be fitted with a Marconi wireless system. Um, so this cost five cents and consisted of eight pages. And again, as many, many, most of you know, um, daily wireless news sheets would soon become uh, standard on passenger liners. And they would include information about the progress of the voyage um, and international news reports that were transmitted by telegraphy. And these items were added onto sheets that had been pre-printed before departure with adverts and a masthead and so on. So one of my fields of research is periodical studies. So I'm very interested in the publishment, publishing of a, an annual supplement to this daily news sheet because the, the kind of rhythm of daily and annual publication is so dif different that it's quite unusual to have um, an annual supplement for a daily paper. Um, but that was produced um, to get, provide a guide to the resorts which the passengers might be going to. Um, with the advent of tourist third cabin, um, a new kind of collaborative onboard publication emerged. And Basil Woon, going back to him just for a moment, actually comments on this. He says that the weekly magazine is possibly the most curious in the world because of the fact that its editors as well as its contributors change with each number. Um, and there's an editorial board chosen from among the passengers. So this cover here was consistent across all the 1925 um, crossings, but each, the content of each um, issue is um, produced by the, the passengers on board, and mainly, as you can see, students and educational tour groups. Um, the visual dimension was particularly impressive. These are some linoleum cuts that were published um, in one of the 1925 issues, which I thought were really good. Um, and the content is quite lighthearted. Um, this example uh, is rules which are about passengers venturing into other classes of accommodation. So um, the first couple are envisaging that the students are trespassing into the first class accommodation. Um, and the third one about slumming, you might think it referred to them going down to the um, fourth class or steerage. There was still a fourth class section um, on the Leviathan in uh, 1925. Um, but it might actually be an ironic reference again to the trespass into first class because there were several references to slumming, um, which imply that the students felt themselves intellectually superior to the wealthy passengers. So actually by going into first class, they were going down in some ways. Um, just another sample of what the magazine looked like inside. Um, there's a poem here celebrating the joys of tourist class where you didn't need to be rich or respectable. Um, as you would in first and second class, respectively. And there's also a guide for embryonic globe trotters, which is rather similar to Basil Woon's um, narrative. Um, so onboard publishing extended in 1923 from periodicals to books. Um, book length items might have been printed up to a century earlier, according to that Vanessa Histon Roberts article, but there's a difference between printing and publishing. So the American writer and bibliographer Christopher Morley um, comments in one of his books that um, he's talking about Captain David Bone of the Anchor Line 
um, in, based in Glasgow. And he says, Captain Bone published the first book, um, so far as I know, that was ever published at sea. Um, and it was especially imprinted for the High Seas Bookshop. And on the publication date, those copies were broken out and sold in mid-ocean. As you know, printing is not publication. The publishing of a book means the actual vending of it to customers. Um, so yes, I have um, discussed this with Martin Bellamy and I wanted to say thank you to him for pointing me towards this. Um, so the High Seas Bookshop, um, it was an innovation of the 20s and it really enhanced the potential of the ship as a site for literary activity. Um, and the first one, was opened on the Anchor Lines ship um, Tuscania in 1922, and then subsequently one on its sister ship Transylvania. And this is um, Captain Bone's um, autobiography, and he describes the excitement that this bookshop generated um, among journalists who were reporting on the Tuscania's maiden voyage. So he says, a new stand or bookstall would have passed unnoticed, for these are fugitive fix fixtures on shipboard as a rule. Um, only set up on sailing days and then vanishing. But the quiet atmosphere of a well-furnished bookshop was something refreshingly new. Um, and the bookshop was designed not only to sell reading material, but to provide a new kind of onboard space. So in the second part, um, Captain Bone re recounts his request to the chief draftsman to, de to design such a space. We shall want a real bookshop, one with cases and shelves, a table perhaps, and a chair or two where the customers can sit down to examine the stock and perhaps talk about books with the attendant. Um, and the draftsman rubbed his ear in puzzlement. This was clearly an odd request. Um, gosh, what kind of an attendant? What does a book sailor look like anyway? I like the book sailor. So the attendants were serious literary figures in their own right. Um, on the earliest journeys, the shop was either kept by William McPhee, who's shown here, who was born at sea um, of Canadian parents, you'll be glad to hear Alan, um, or by the Scottish journalist and critic, William Matthew Parker. Um, so these were very well connected men, actually. Um, Parker and Bone were acquainted with Joseph Conrad, um, whom they met on board. Well, um, McPhee and Morley and David Bone um, met at gatherings at the famous um, Greenwich Village bookshop run by Frank Shea. And all of their signatures appear on the bookshop door, which you can see a piece of here with Christopher Morley's name in the middle. Um, and you can see the whole door on a website at the University of Texas where they've identified most of the members of this literary network. So these professional and social networks enabled the success of the High Seas Bookshop and that in turn enhanced the literary careers of these, this group of men. Um, this is a sort of surviving catalogue for the bookshop on the Transylvania and it features titles by all of the people I was mentioning. You can see several of their names there. Um, and it includes a section you can see here for books about the sea and sea life, nautical books. Um, and then there's miscellaneous books, but there's a real bias in this miscellaneous section towards more stories of adventure and travel. Um, and then the next one. Yeah. And the catalogue makes this claim for the bookshop. This is on the back. The High Seas Bookshop has become an Atlantic exchange in the world of books. Through its good offices, American authors not widely known in Britain have found a public and not infrequently a British publisher and then also the other way around. In this unique bookshop, an international agency has been established. And indeed in the catalogue, the titles do represent a fair balance between American and British authors. Um, although male writers outnumber um, women writers by 30 to 1, um, which is not a good representation of the ratio of travelling passengers at this time. It's more about a vision of transatlantic literature that centres on the sea itself and on tropes of adventure and discovery. So I think in circulating such books, David Bone performed an important function as a tastemaker. And I think through his different roles as author, publisher, bookseller, host and also as ship's captain, 
Um, you could see Bone as himself emblematic of this transatlantic literary exchange that I'm talking about in both its material aspects and in terms of um, the actual writing. So I've been trying in this talk then to connect those practical and semantic aspects of the liner's role in interwar literary culture. So it did provide really rich subject matter for writers and artists who were, I think, fascinated by the ocean liner as, as a social stage, as well as a site of cultural encounter. And I've suggested that in fiction, the passengers are frequently seen surrounded by books, um, but they rarely seem to actually read any. Whereas the historical record suggests that actually the interwar liner was very important to transatlantic cultures of reading and print. Um, so it did use the latest technology, radio technology, printing its own serial publications, buying and selling books and, and providing these spaces, which I have don't think have been discussed so much for onboard reading and discussion. So I think it can be understood in effect as a media technology, as well as an important agent of international literary exchange. <clears throat> that is the end. Right. Um, good. Thank you very much uh, for, for that. Um, I think I'm back on the screen. I think we're sharing the stage now, if, I, if my choreography is working well. I wonder if I could start, there are a couple of questions which I'll, I'll relay to you. Um, I've got an ill-formed one, uh, if I may uh, start. Um, I, I was fascinated by, by, by all of this um, and uh, you know, to learn about the, the place of, of books and, and, and reading and the importance of them. Uh, on uh, on liners as as you know um, a means of, of of exchange, but it struck me was that even within the novels that you talked about themselves, um, it seemed to me that that reading uh, there was portrayed uh, as a as, as a way of um, of defining you know social boundaries and, and, and categories and um, you know it was described within the novels themselves as uh, as, as an important. Um, site of, 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 of exchange and, 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 and definition. And, and, and it seemed that the liners themselves, the ocean liners them, them, themselves were acting like um, just a, as a stage uh, on which, on which these, these social uh, situations were, 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 un, were unfolding. And, and, and I wondered um, if, if I, well, I assumed, and, and, I, and I wonder if it's the case that many of these same types of, of, of novels from the, from, from the time took the liners and, and, and used them more as characters, you know, if, they, if the liner itself was ever like a character in, in, in any of these things, um, uh, you know, it, it, it bring, bringing something other, almost otherworldly into the, into the lives of, of, of these people and, and complicating social relations and, 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 and this, this, this sort of thing. It just seems to me that there's a there's an opportunity there with the, with, with the with, with the liner to 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 affect these things more uh, more more directly. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think my the idea of the liner as a stage is is one kind of metaphor, isn't it? And, and as a mm. character, as another one. And I think absolutely, there's quite a few of the books I've read that don't name the ship at all, and it's just it could be any ship. You know, it's it is very much just a stage for the performance of the passengers, whereas there are others where it becomes quite important, where they're set on a real um, real historical ship uh, rather than just an imaginary one, um, or where they develop a certain amount of love for it. Actually, that um, Humphrey Jordan book, um, the ship which Coke is given command of is a very old, uh, 50 years old, and it's called the Magnolia, and he's very disappointed because he expected a better ship. Uh, but he eventually comes to love it and he talks a lot about how beautiful it was and it's it's too small but he finds that it's perfectly formed in the end um so in that one there's this kind of three-way relationship between the captain and the steward and the ship mm. um whereas and in fact some of the others that do name Lorelei and the Majestic you know you actually do get quite a lot of detail whereby she sees the Majestic as the perfect setting for her because of its similarities to the Ritz hotels which we could <laughs> go into more um, and that one is, is repeatedly name checked but there are quite a few of this where it the actual ship seems to rather recede into the background 
I'm less interested in those, but I'm still interested in the comparison, you know, the way that being on the sea is still seen as such a um, very good place to set a drama, particularly because of the confinement and the fact that you can't mm. escape from those people who might be a threat to you. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So system. Okay, I better move on. We've got some some questions. So um, Hugh Murphy uh, says hello, um, and he's actually seen Westward Passage. So as as to the question posed by the movie blurb, does marriage end romance? Probably, he says in his inimitable style, I'm sure. However, in the golden age of Atlantic liner travel, the shipping companies played up the romantic aspect of liner travel, certainly for the higher paying passengers. And he wonders if you could comment on, on, on that a bit. Yes, you're right, because at the end of Westwood Passage, she decides not to get back together with her um, former husband and go back to her current husband, who's thought to be rather dull, um, but quite solid. Um, so yeah, the... <laughs> But the romance takes place in the space of the ship, and when she gets back onto land, it all kind of falls apart. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think in this way, the literary texts and the advertising texts are working in tandem. You know, the amount of romantic tension that you get in these narratives. Of course, the most famous one being in Brideshead Revisited. Um, I th the rhetoric is very similar to uh, what you get in the promotional um, texts, not just in terms of written text, but in terms of the romantic images in the advertising and the sort of well-dressed couples leaning against the rail and all the rest of it. Um, and even the little comments in the adverts about who you might possibly meet on this journey. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think there's a way here in which even the stories of romance that ends in disaster are still playing into this whole, you know, promotional idea of the ship as a place for romance, so definitely. Okay. Now, Sarah Galtley is you know, onto something here, I think. She's, she's talking about, um, Hi, Sarah. given your comments on the value uh, now attached to the cover art of the frantic Atlantic rather than its contents, she was wondering if you found any engagement in these texts with the role of books or book covers as cultural and or status symbols for those traveling aboard ships. In other words, was see being seen on deck with certain books just as valuable as actually reading them. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, I think, yeah, that's exactly what Olivia was doing in that one example. She was just showing off with her French novels. Mm. Um, and I was, when I was looking around for images to illustrate this talk, some of the ones that I couldn't use for copyright reasons were um, pictures of people on deck chairs with books just kind of um, lying beside them, but not actually, mm -hmm. you couldn't find very many pictures of people with the book. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, Lorelai is sitting there with her book of etiquette on the deck, um, but there are other things that she only does in the privacy of her cabin. Um, and she talks to certain people on the deck and she talks when she's in a cabin, she gets on better with the steward, um, but she then ignores him when she goes on deck to talk to the powerful men. And it's the same thing with her reading practices. Some of them are exhibited and some of them, um, well, like her writing of the diary are very private. So yeah, I think actually that, um, that has come up in quite a few of the books I've read. I haven't read any particular discussion of this, but I think that will be, um, that will be a good thing for me to emphasize in my work. So yes, thank you. Okay, and, and now Ian Stafford's got a, a question about these, these, these libraries, because presumably they weren't just, you know, like you, you, you find now, you know, pe people leaving the paperback they read behind, you know, as, as an exchange. There must have been people choosing the library and, and um, uh, and and so he's he's asking about that. Who who took who would choose a library? And and is there a, a a difference in policy between between lines? You know, did some some lines have a particular type of library and others? Now here I feel that I believe Suzanne Lubick is here. I think she would know the answer a lot better than I would um, because this is something I've only just begun to. Um, look at and anything that I know so far is derived from the research of her and the other people I was um, mentioning. Um, so I would like to know the answer to this, but at the current time, I don't know the answer. Um, so if there's anyone else who does, <laughs> you want to, um, I think some of the questions and comments are coming up in the chat and some of them are- Yeah, in so I'll get to those in a, in yeah, the, in maybe a someone can, right. can give us yeah. some help with that question because yeah, that is, Okay, yeah, That's if anybody doesn't know, then, then please. Uh, uh, yeah. And so you and Grant uh, is thanking you and, and following on from this uh, business of, of the ship as, as characters, what did the crews 
uh, think of the books uh, he's asking. They, after all, were, were working. Yeah, I mean, this is where we don't really have enough evidence, I think, um, because, well, from literary texts, not many of them represent the experience of crew. As I was saying, you have to really root around to find um, them. Um, in terms of archival evidence, I also don't have any yet. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop looking because I and also my PhD student are both trying to find more evidence um, on this point of at the moment, just as we were starting to get somewhere, the archives were all closed. Um, but there is quite a lot of um, personal recorded material in some of the collections at Glasgow University, which um, is, you know, diaries and things like that relating to passengers, but where you would actually find any record of crew members reading is, in, is going to be much more difficult, I think. Um, okay, so. well, we have a related question then from Jane Bowden Dam. And this one was this one was put in the in the in the chat. And she's noticed that there are quite a few child passengers um, that she spotted. Were there publications on board Atlantic liners uh, for their benefit? I mean, is there a children's section? There are in the magazines. They do have uh, some of them do have children's pages actually, um, and either poems or puzzles or things like that um, in some of the um, sort of news sheets and magazines that were distributed on board. Um, in the catalogue that I've got there for the High Seas Bookshop, there are not necessarily um, directly children's books, but there certainly are the kind of books that a lot of people would have read at quite a young age, you know, adventure stories, for example. So they would be able to find something um, I've also been quite interested in the children's playrooms and some of the pictures I've seen of children's playrooms on board did have what looks like bookshelves um, in them as well as toys. So I'm thinking that there would have been a certain amount of provision for child yeah. readers. Oh, yeah. I can see Susan's actually yes, helped us out there. with that question. What to stock in libraries, she says, would have been shipping company managers based on recommendations of booksellers, often based on what booksellers also suggested to uh, normal public libraries. But often these libraries were established at the time of the launch of the liner. So yeah, you can imagine that the main stock would have been there from the start and would be going backwards and forwards on each journey. Um, but then I can see that's really helpful to know that the um, managers would take recommendations from booksellers, which might be similar to the ones that would be given to land-based libraries. So yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Hmm, I, couldn't, I couldn't see that, so I've, I've lost my, uh, my... Oh, it's in the bottom of the Q&A. All oh, right, okay. Oh, so it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, well, here's a, here's what I, th I think might be a challenging one from um, from Sophie Oliver. Uh, uh, so she's uh, talking about not reading with respect to not reading. She's wondering about not on board. So in other words, books that don't show the voyage despite the trip being very central. So maybe you know James is the ambassadors, for example. Have you found others that don't show the voyage itself? And uh, she's wondering why they might not. Yes, actually, um, several. And I was wondering, I was thinking about whether or not to be discussing those in my project and um, what to say about the, the sort of absence or skipping over um, of the journey. Um, one that I've been looking at recently, going back to my Canadian literature, um, Sarah Jeanette Duncan um, wrote a book called A Social Departure, which is about a trip around the world in 1890. Um, and when she gets she starts off in um, the east, in eastern Canada and goes across to Vancouver and then she just says um, about the Pacific Ocean it is best to say as little as possible and there's a couple <laughs> of sentences about how she's not going to describe that journey and then she's in Japan um, so yeah you, you kind of feel like you're being spared the gruesome details because her story is really about the countries that she visited um, and she has a little bit more to say later about the ships of the P&O when she's going on shorter journeys between different countries in Asia and suddenly discovering um, the joys of traveling in some of these waters and the, the levels of service and so on. Um, but there is this kind of huge gap. Um, and I've seen several other um, texts that do something similar that kind of um, that explicitly step over the voyage as something that was too unpleasant to remember. Um, one really interesting example is um, another Harlem Renaissance figure, um, Claude Mackay, and his novel Romance in Marseille, which was written around 
1930, but not published until this year. Um, actually, the, the main character stows away um, on a liner and he is sitting right near to a toilet and his, uh, it's so very cold that actually his legs get frozen and they have to be amputated when he arrives at the other side. Um, so again, the whole of that journey is compressed into one really horrific sentence. Um, and the rest of it is about what happens when he gets there and his negotiation for insurance payments from the shipping company and how they won't pay because he was a stowaway and so on. So it's very much about the ocean liner, but nothing happens kind of on it, if you like. Hmm. So yeah, I think this will be a, a good, I should probably pay more attention to these texts actually is where there's a gap. I think that would be interesting. Thank you, Sophie. Right, okay, here's a different sort of question from, from Sarah Palmer who wants to know about uh, the commercial motive uh, that uh, companies might have had in providing literature to passengers, you know, like charging for borrowing or, you know, that book vending machine and, 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 the, and this sort of thing. And maybe, maybe even, I don't know, there may be some connections to the publishing uh, uh, houses themselves, but, or uh, as she's asking, was it seen simply as a service to passengers, was there? commercial element or was it just a service? As far as I understand it, it, it was very important that um, the shipping companies could show that they provided for um, this kind of entertainment as in reading um, and that they had libraries and they had bookstores or whatever. So I think the most important thing is as a service to passengers. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, they there could be, I, I think we should probably see the, the charges for the libraries as more just sort of covering costs um, rather than making a profit, I think. Um, but in terms of the book vending machines, that would have been a kind of mutually beneficial arrangement between the publisher, let's say the Reclam publisher in this case, um, and the shipping company, because it's another service, um, but it also makes a profit for the publishing house rather than for the shipping company. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I think this is a kind of collaboration really um, in that case, but my understanding is that with the libraries, the emphasis was much more on the service um, provided to passengers or in the early days, as I mentioned, when I was referring to these articles, it might have been more of a paternalistic purpose of trying to encourage emigrants or even convicts to read um, something improving. Right. Well, I'm going to jump over to the Q&A box again, uh, where the questions were, because there's a related question, I suppose, uh, or it follows on, on from that, because Alexander Pickering's asking about uh, literature that might have been banned from libraries. And did they, did they uh, on the sea, outside of the confines of, of normal society, did they allow for socially taboo books to flourish, or, or was it the, the opposite, I wonder? Uh, that's not one that I know the answer to, I must say, but it's a very good question. Mm, mm. If anybody else has got any insights on that, um, please let me know. But actually, that is a really interesting question because there would have been certain types of regulations which <laughs> wouldn't have been enforceable in this context. So, you know, whose who's national rules do these libraries belong to? And mm. that's a question that rises, arises in terms of other practices on board ship as well. So, yeah, that's one that I need to, I need to look into, actually. Okay, and there's one from Esmond Easton Lamb, who's thanking you for a fascinating presentation, which I think we're all going to do pretty soon. Uh, but um, he's wondering uh, to what extent these novels that you talk about engage with politics and contemporary events that are happening outside of the insular clothes setting of the ship in, in, in environment, or, or, or is, it, is the clothes environment so much the point that they... they... Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I think that would be very different. That would be a different answer for each book. Um, some of them, absolutely, the enclosed environment really is the point, and it is a kind of world apart from um, the rules of ordinary life. Um, so the Westwood Passage would be a good example of that. Um, and also, gentlemen prefer blondes because Lorelai seeks to replicate that kind of closed environment wherever she goes on land. So she's happiest in a setting such as the Ritz Hotel and when she gets to London and to Paris, all she wants to do is enclose herself in the Ritz. Um, but other books, it would be a very different answer. Um, the one, the Seaway, only the Humphrey Jordan book, um, there's a lot of engagement there with um, aspects which perhaps were suggested in the quotations, but to do with um, finance and to do with 
power. There's a scene set in the boardroom. Um, there's quite a lot of emphasis also on the cultures of the different countries that are visited on the voyage, which again, you don't get in all of these texts. Sometimes they never even get anywhere. Um, and sometimes when they do, you see nothing but you know the gangway. Um, the one I mentioned a minute ago, Romance in Marseille, in answer to Sophie's question, that um, is then primarily concerned with um, black communities uh, who live alongside the docks in Marseille. So it's very much um, engaged with those kind of aspects. So yeah, really different in different cases, but there are some books which are completely enclosed and completely cut off from those larger issues, absolutely. When I think about literature and the sea, I can't help but think of, of Joseph Conrad and just how wonderful he is and how good a writer he is and uh, and how he incorporates the sea and uh, and and so forth so just as a maybe as a as a as a as a final uh, question I mean, just how is he the big literary giant of 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 your of your world or or do i have an exaggerated sense of of um, you know his 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 place well no i don't think it is exaggerated because i think you know the way that he was referenced in those texts i was looking yeah. at is good, is an indication of yeah, the statue of Conrad in this mm -hmm. area. I suppose you are getting a somewhat of a different emphasis in some of the type of books I'm looking at where I'm thinking a little bit more about um, the passenger experience and the kind of onboard society and those kind of aspects rather than um, more of a seafaring sea novel, if you like. I suppose mm -hmm. I'm looking more at the kind of commercial um, passenger right. shipping and rather less at, um, a kind of more adventure oriented narrative. But I still think that Conrad, as you say, is he's referenced quite a lot. He's kind of, there's a lot of reading of Conrad or not reading of Conrad going on mm. um, on these ships. So yeah, uh, right. certainly crucial. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, well that that is uh, excellent. Um, so thank you uh, for, for that. Um, I think we've covered uh, everybody's uh, questions and we've certainly, uh, got our money's worth, as it were, uh, fr from you. We certainly appreciate uh, that fascinating look at this world of, uh, uh, of literature and uh, some amazing answers, as people are, are saying to you in the, in, in the chat. So um, I think uh, it's time, and, and, and again, this is, this is where I want to break out into applause, but I, I, I can't on my own because it's too, it's too awkward, but I will, I will uh, raise a glass and I, and I hope everybody at home has an opportunity to do this uh, as well and uh, we can give you our, our, our collective thanks. I want to say thank you very much for these questions, which are so helpful, and I've copied all of them, so I'm going to go and look into some of these things more thank you and for the answers right. that some people have given as well thank you right uh, there were 32 of us sarah palmer wants to know uh 32 of you anyway 32 attendees tonight so uh this was uh, a very popular uh, popular talk and and you'll you'll see in the in the in the chat say that uh, people are extending their their thanks thank you to you so thank you very much Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody, and, and we'll see you in, in next term, and I'll, I'll update everybody with the uh, much fuller program to come.